HIV is arguably one of the worst sexually transmitted infections, and this is because there is no cure, and if left untreated, it can lead to death. So today, we're going to talk about what this virus does to a person once it gets inside the body. We'll also discuss how you get HIV in a little bit of a different way, meaning we're going to cover how different forms of intercourse have different levels of risk for transmitting the infection, and why certain people are more at risk of getting HIV, including males versus females. And of course, cover the effectiveness of current treatment options, prevention strategies, including PrEP, and who should consider getting tested for HIV. It's definitely going to be an interesting one, so let's do this. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, and it belongs to a class of viruses known as retroviruses. Retroviruses use RNA to encode their genetic information rather than DNA. And this retrovirus actually targets our immune system, specifically white blood cells called CD4 cells, often referred to as helper T cells. And we're going to get into why infecting these white blood cells is so critical with HIV in just a minute. But how do we get HIV? Well, many of you have probably heard that HIV is transmitted through contact with infected bodily fluids, such as blood, semen, vaginal fluids, and breast milk, which means this can happen during unprotected sex, sharing needles with drug use, from mother to child with breastfeeding and during childbirth, and through blood transfusions with infected blood. However, it is also important to note that HIV cannot be spread through casual contact like shaking hands, hugging, kissing, or sharing utensils. But what would your odds be if you did have non-casual contact with someone that is infected with HIV, or in other words, you had intercourse with someone with HIV, or came in contact with some of these infected bodily fluids? Well, here are some interesting estimates or odds based on modeling studies with discordant couples. And as an FYI, a discordant couple is a pair of long-term sexual partners in which one has a sexually transmitted infection, but the other does not. And I'm going to list these from highest risk to lowest risk. And topping the list for the highest risk is receptive anal intercourse, with the risk being one transmission per 72 sex acts. So in other words, it was estimated that the risk of getting HIV for the non-infected individual that participated in receptive anal intercourse was one out of 72. Now, the reason why receptive anal intercourse is the highest risk is due to the nature of the anus and the rectum. The mucosal lining is thinner and more prone to tears and abrasions, which can facilitate the virus's entry into the body. This also explains why men that have intercourse with men are more likely to get HIV. It doesn't mean they are the only people that contract HIV in this way, it's just that they have a higher likelihood of participating in anal intercourse and therefore increases their risk. Insertive anal intercourse was next as far as risk with one transmission per 900 sex acts. So less risky than receptive as the skin of the penis is thicker and more durable than the mucosal lining of the rectum. But this is still more risky than vaginal intercourse as receptive penile vaginal intercourse was one transmission per 1250 sex acts whereas insertive penile vaginal intercourse was one transmission per 2,500 sex acts, meaning that a non-infected female is more likely to get it from an infected male than a non-infected male is to get it from an infected female. Females having a higher risk likely has to do with the larger surface area of the vaginal lining that can be exposed to the virus and also due to infected semen potentially staying in the vaginal canal for an extended period of time, therefore increasing the exposure time to the virus. And lastly, receptive or insert of penile oral intercourse was about zero to four transmissions per 10,000 sex acts. And as an FYI, female to female sexual transmission of HIV is very rarely reported. I think it is also worth mentioning the risk of getting HIV from non-sexual bloodborne exposure. A blood transfusion with infected blood, for example, the risk was nine out of 10. Needle sharing with injection drug use was one out of 150. Percutaneous needle sticks, which could be like an accidental needle stick that can occur with healthcare workers, was one out of 435. And mucous membrane exposure to blood, like splashes to the eye, was one out of 1,000. Now, it is definitely interesting to see some of those numbers. However, I do think we need to go back to the numbers or the estimates that we discussed with sexual exposure, because the risk of contracting HIV is likely a bit higher for other populations of people for a number of reasons. One, remember I mentioned that these estimates were from modeled studies from discordant couples, monogamous couples that had a known infected partner, some of whom were likely receiving treatment for HIV, which we're gonna learn reduces the risk of spreading the infection. And two, people that are not in monogamous relationships and have multiple sex partners 
have a higher likelihood of encountering those that have HIV. And many of these people don't even know that they have HIV. And if someone is in the acute phase of HIV, this is significant because the acute early phase of HIV is when people have a higher viral load and tend to shed more of the virus and therefore can more easily spread the infection. And the third point I wanna make is whether your odds of contracting HIV are 2% or 3% with certain types of intercourse, that is only part of the risk assessment. You have to go further with this because some might view those numbers and say, I'll take those odds. But let's say there is this scenario where you have a two to 3% chance of catching a common cold and a two to 3% chance of catching HIV. I'm not saying the odds of catching a cold and HIV are the exact same in reality, it's just to illustrate this point on risk. But in this example, the odds of catching either illness are the same. But what is the weight of the consequences if you hit those two to 3% odds? You catch the cold, it's going to bother you for one to two weeks. You catch HIV, as of today, with the current treatment available, that's going to change your life. So coming back to what happens when someone first gets infected with HIV. Well, as we've already hinted, many people don't know that they have been infected with HIV in the first place. One of the reasons for this is that many people can be asymptomatic, or when people do get symptoms, they can be mild or mimic other illnesses so that the person often won't seek medical attention. And again, remember, this is when the person has a higher viral load and can more easily spread the virus. When people do experience symptoms, it often feels like a flu-like illness, with some of the most common symptoms being fever, headache, sore throat, muscle aches, and fatigue. But some can also experience rash, diarrhea, weight loss, and even ulcerations of the skin and mucous membranes. These symptoms usually appear two to four weeks after exposure, and for most, the symptoms typically resolve on their own. But there are some people where the symptoms get bad enough that they will seek medical attention and can even be hospitalized. And from one perspective, that could be kind of a good thing because this increases the likelihood of early detection and treatment. Now, another thing that I mentioned earlier that is very important to our discussion is that HIV mainly targets a white blood cell called a CD4 or helper T cell. CD4 cells serve as the major regulators of virtually all immune functions. You could kind of in a way think of these as the bosses of the immune system. And in the absence of these cells, the remainder of the immune system is almost paralyzed. So during the next few months after initial infection, many of these CD4 cells are being attacked and killed. But in the early stages of HIV, the body can replace many of these killed CD4 cells. However, this can only go on for so long. Also during early infection, other immune cells will produce antibodies to the virus, which is the basis of some of the HIV tests. Then at about six months, a person will reach what is known as the viral set point which is when the plasma virus concentration reaches this steady state level. You can kind of think of this as an equilibrium where the viral levels are staying about the same and are not as high as they were during the initial acute phase of the infection. And this is the point where one enters into the stage of chronic HIV. During chronic HIV, most individuals have few to no symptoms, but what is happening within the body is that the CD4 cells are declining. And once the CD4 cells get to a level less than 200 cells per microliter, and as a reference, normal CD4 levels range from about 500 to 1400 cells per microliter. But again, once the CD4 cells get below 200 cells per microliter, that is when a person develops AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And this is what makes HIV develop into a deadly condition. Because once you get CD4 cells below 200 cells per microliter, the body can't mount much of an immune response leaving the body unprotected against other opportunistic infections. In a way, HIV never directly kills anyone. It is the infections that they can get once their CD4 count gets too low. On average, it takes about eight to 10 years for someone's CD4 levels to get below 200 cells per microliter or to develop AIDS. But this is for untreated individuals. And while there's no current cure for HIV, treatment called antiretroviral therapy or ART can be very effective and dramatically slow the disease's progression. ART involves taking a combination of HIV medications every day, and someone would need to take these medications indefinitely. These medications should be initiated as soon as possible, and if taken as prescribed, ART can reduce the amount of HIV in the body, decreasing that viral load to a very low level, which helps maintain those CD4 cells and prevents illness. HIV medications have the potential to decrease viral load so much that a test can't even detect it. This is referred to as undetectable viral load. And if someone is able to get to this point, 
Studies have shown that there is virtually no risk of transmission through all forms of intercourse, and even greatly reduces the risk during pregnancy, labor, and delivery if a mother is infected with HIV. Now, some of you may have heard of PrEP and PEP. PrEP refers to pre-exposure prophylaxis, and PEP refers to post-exposure prophylaxis. Both are ways of using antiretroviral therapy to help prevent contracting HIV, but with different strategies. PrEP, as the name implies, would be initiated prior to exposure and would be used for people that are continually at high risk of getting HIV. Multiple and frequent sex partners, especially if this is unprotected, IV drug users, or someone that has a monogamous partner that has known HIV and could be even receiving treatment for this, but maybe they haven't quite got their viral load to that undetectable state yet. And someone who is taking PrEP would take it continually once it was initiated until there's a change in those high-risk behaviors or situations. PEP, or again, post-exposure prophylaxis, would need to be taken within 72 hours of a high-risk exposure. And there are various situations that could be considered high-risk known contact with infected blood or bodily fluids, in certain situations of unprotected intercourse with someone that had known HIV or even an unknown HIV status. But I think it is important to note that risk does need to be assessed accurately, so anyone considering either PrEP or PEP would want to discuss this with their healthcare provider. So who should be tested for HIV? Well, anyone with a known exposure or that has signs and symptoms consistent with HIV should be tested. It is also recommended as a routine screening during pregnancy, and healthcare workers that say, had an accidental needle stick should also be tested. And as you can probably tell, there's a story coming along with this because when I was in my clinical year and I was doing a laceration repair on a patient, I was an idiot face and grabbed the suture needle with my hand to place it in the driver, and I accidentally poked my finger, so I was tested for a handful of bloodborne pathogens, and luckily, everything came back negative. Now, hopefully, it goes without saying that if someone had a fever and a sore throat, that they don't necessarily just need to rush in and get tested. As you may recall, those are some of the possible symptoms that can occur during early HIV. But it is more nuanced than this. A medical provider would ask about other possible symptoms, recent sexual encounters, and address other risk factors before just jumping to the HIV test. However, because HIV can be asymptomatic, it is reasonable and even recommended that people that are healthy and have very little risk factors for HIV get tested at least once in their lifetime. And then any further or consistent testing would be on a case-by-case -case basis, say like for individuals with higher risk behaviors, again, multiple sex partners and or unprotected sex with an unknown individual, injection drug use, or if you have a partner that has HIV. Now this doesn't cover every possible reason to get tested, but frankly, there are so many companies now that offer HIV testing that you could pay for out of pocket and get tested whenever you want. But something else to keep in mind is the timing of the test. For example, if I have a patient come in and it's five or six days after they've had a high-risk sexual encounter and they're requesting HIV testing, this actually isn't a great time to be tested because one of the most commonly used tests is the fourth generation HIV test which is a combo antibody antigen test. But this cannot detect HIV until about 15 to 20 days after exposure. So for better accuracy, one would need to wait until that time. And unfortunately, this can create some anxiety. Which brings us to the idea that overall, doing your best to prevent HIV transmission is the key. Safe sex practices, using sterile needles, universal precautions, screening when appropriate, and for those at high risk, pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP is a possible option to help reduce the risk of getting HIV. And lastly, if you or someone you know has HIV and is not currently being treated for it, please do not hesitate to get in touch with a healthcare provider to look into initiating treatment. The earlier the treatment is initiated, the better. And one can definitely still live a long, healthy life with proper and consistent treatment. So hopefully this gave you some new and useful information about HIV. And thank you for supporting our channel. Let us know what you thought of this video in the comments. and. We'll see you in the next video.